Good morning, Rush Church. It is great to see you all, and Merry Christmas. We are in Christmas season. I'm very excited about Christmas. I love it. So if you'd like to stand to join us, we're going to get started off singing this morning, uh, Heart the Herald Angels Sing.
Good morning, everyone. I uh, love Christmas time. I love the Christmas season. And, uh, well, it's just one of my favorite times of the year. And I want to thank Leslie and other people who helped, of course, but she's the one that sets this up and does all this beautiful decoration. And she does this every year. And so I just really appreciate it. And I appreciate everybody who came to help for that. Uh, she will probably deny this, but I gave a few suggestions while we were putting this together. And the response I got was, well, we could. <laughs> I can take a hint. That's all right. I was allowed to like hang one wreath, I think. That was pretty much the extent of my contribution here. But uh, just a couple things. I won't keep it real long. I do want to talk about something a little bit later. Don't forget the winter warm-up, uh, and that's, that happens in town at the fairgrounds. That's coming up this weekend, Friday and Saturday. And uh, if you want to help with that, you certainly can. Uh, again, that's going to be at the fairgrounds, and probably the best way to get the details for that is just call the office. We don't have to go into a whole lot of it right now. Just call the office. We'll be able to give you all the details. Also, our Christmas Eve service. We're going to do that. That's, uh, you know, that's coming up uh, pretty soon, 4.30 and 6 o'clock. I always forget those times. If you're like me, you'll forget those times too. But 4.30 and 6 o'clock, we do two services. Um, we're going to be able to worship and praise in that time. There's something else I want to talk about at the beginning of the message. Another way that you can, if you want to, serve uh, this community uh, coming up actually very, very quickly. And so uh, I'll talk about that just a little bit later on. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you that Jesus uh, is born, that he died, but that he lives eternally. And we thank you, Father, that we have absolute certainty for eternal life through the death and resurrection of Christ. Father, that's why we're here. We're here to praise you. We're here to thank you. We're here to worship you. We're here to learn about you. Uh, but right now, we're here to remember this incredible sacrifice, this incredible love, uh, particularly started uh, in this tangible way on Christmas. And so we thank you, Father, for that. And that's, we invite you into this place and into this time. In Jesus' name, amen. child is this? What child is this who laid to rest on Mary's lap is sleeping? Who angels greet with anthems sweet while shepherds watch our
Good morning. So wonderful to see so many people here this morning in God's house, praising and worshiping him today. Well, the weeks before Christmas are a time to make preparations for the coming celebration of Jesus' birth. Uh, In the core household, one of our traditions is having Advent calendars for our kids to count down the days before Christmas. And each day, the kids uh, open a door and they get a small surprise. This year has been challenging with a four-year-old. Grant can't wait to open one door at a time. And on day one, he opened about six or seven. Needless to say, uh, his advent calendar is now on top of the refrigerator, and we bring it down each day for him. Just like we make preparations for the season, it's important to note that God began making preparations for the first Christmas generations before Gabriel's announcement to Mary. The first book of the Bible is filled with stories of the Jewish patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and his 12 sons. When Jacob was about to pass, he spoke of what God was planning to do through his sons. Jacob directed his children to prepare for the king's arrival. In Genesis 49, 8 through 10, Jacob said, Judah, your brothers will praise you. Your hand will be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's son will bow down to you. You are a lion's cub, Judah. You return from the prey, my son. Like a lion, he crouches and lies down. Like a lioness, who dares to rouse him. The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until he to whom it belongs shall come, and the obedience of the nations shall be his. Jacob promised that a son of Judah would rule over all the nations. God intended for this ruler to rightly wield ultimate authority. This reason reminds Christians that Jacob's announcement was realized with Jesus' birth. God's mighty ruler from the tribe of Judah would come to earth as a baby. Jesus fulfilled God's work by giving up his life on the cross for the benefit of the world. 1 Timothy 1.15 says, Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. The communion table helps us to remember the price that Jesus paid. We eat the bread to remember Jesus' broken body. We we drink from the cup to recall his sacrificed blood. As we prepare to celebrate Christmas, let's focus on Jesus' sacrifice for all his people. His death provides salvation from the world's brokenness. Let us pray. Dear gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for your plan, for your preparation thousands of years ago to send your Son to save us from our brokenness. Lord, as we take this cup and we take this bread, let us take this time to reflect on our lives in our relationship with you. We ask these these words in your name.
Thank you, Charlotte. Good morning. Show of hands, let's see, six, right, December. Show of hands, has anybody gotten a Merry Christmas yet? Anybody? All right, here we go. You have? Cliff, come on, man, I wanted to be the first. You just lie, can we lie for a second? No? Speaking of it, did you? Oh, I wasn't in here. Okay. I had things to do. Okay. All right. Well, forget about all that. Um, we, I do want to address the many little elephants in the room uh, for a second. You know, sometimes when, uh, when we go to church, you know, and, and, and we have the, the benefit in this place of having, having children's worship and uh, having adult worship, and sometimes when we combine the two, parents, it's easy to get a little apprehensive and wonder <laughs> how things are going to go and what's going to happen. And I I just want you to be secure that uh, I I don't mind kids being kids if you don't, right? I mean, I'm glad uh, that our kids and our family are a part of this body here in this worship service, that moms and dads are are leading their their kids to uh, be a part of that. And uh, so I want you to experience and enjoy the lesson today. Uh, The second thing I want to talk about is an opportunity that uh, we and, and a few others have been given uh, to serve here in the community. I was talking to uh, uh, John a couple uh, yesterday and, and uh, ended up calling Marmon Valley. Uh, they put on the country Christmas, as you know. Many of you have seen that, uh, been there and experienced that. We have. It's a lot of fun. Uh, but this year in particular, they're having a little bit of difficulty filling some positions, filling some spots to be in the cast. And um, if that's something you would like to do, they could use some people this Saturday and Sunday to be a part of that. Um, in fact, you don't have to, you know, you don't have to do anything. You don't have to say anything. You, you do have to recite the first three chapters of Luke by memory. That'll be. But other than that. Uh, uh, no, they, they just, they need some more people to be involved in that, and uh, if that's something you want to do, if that sounds like fun to you, um, I encourage you to be a part of that. You can call the church office, and we can go ahead and get a hold of them. I already told them that I would call them later this week if we had any volunteers. Uh, you would show up at 4 o'clock. Now, it's a whole afternoon, okay? So you'd show up at 4 o'clock on Saturday or Sunday or both if you wanted to volunteer for both days. And you would go through a cast meeting, so you're not just going to be thrown into stuff. You know, good luck. Here we go. Uh, no, you go through a cast meeting at 4 o'clock, and from there you're able to get into uh, costume and get into character and get to where you need to be and where you need to go, and they'll walk you through that process. And it goes then throughout the evening. I think it finishes up about 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock. So it's a whole afternoon. I mean, it's a, it's a big deal. Uh, but it's an opportunity for us to serve in that way, and I think it could be a whole lot of fun. Uh, I, I asked Cody as well to see if he wants to talk to the uh, our students and see if they want to participate in it too. Uh, they do ask that anybody who is involved is over 12 years old. Over 12, I get that, you know, you got a lot of people moving about and doing things and a lot of strangers going through, and so they want people at least 12 years old, um, and uh, uh, if, if you're interested in serving, please just let me know. Call the church, and uh, I'll get you squared away. Uh, turn with me, if you will, to Matthew chapter 1, Matthew chapter 1, Um. I don't know how often you've thought or how often you maybe use your imagination when you go through Scripture. And I've told you this many times that we need to do that. When you read Scripture, whether it's the Old Testament or the New Testament, it doesn't matter. You've got to use your imagination. You've got to put yourself in there, either observing objectively or even putting yourself in the role to fully grasp the context of Scripture. And today and throughout this month, we get to look at, perhaps from a new perspective, we get to look at Christmas. Today we're going to look at Joseph's first Christmas. 
And I've subtitled this, at least in my notes, God chose well. God chose well. You see, the truth is God had a choice to make and Joseph had a choice to make when it came to raising Jesus. Yes, raising him as a boy. And I think we find as we look at Joseph's first Christmas that God chose well. It's a fun way to look at it. I'm also reminded as I think about Joseph's role and the, the difficulty that he took on being a part of Jesus' life and raising Jesus. I'm reminded of a, of a song you've probably heard. It's, it's, uh, it's a few years old by now. It's a country singer. He sang a song that is entitled, The Dad He Didn't Have to Be. The Dad He Didn't Have to Be. And it talks about how there was a man who chose and decided to help raise up uh, in the, the, the character in the song, chose to help raise up this little boy and to give to him, to lead him, to teach him, to help direct him and guide him through life. And at no point leading up to this, this commitment, at no point did this man have to say yes. But he chose to say yes. He chose to say yes because it was good, because it was right. He chose to say yes so that he could be involved in the little boy's life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you that we get to worship once again. We thank you that, that this is a gift right here today as we come together as brothers and sisters. This is a gift you've given us to worship together like this. We thank you, Father, that you've given us the opportunity to read through Scripture and put ourselves in the position of so many wonderful people and so many wonderful characters throughout Scripture. Father, we ask that you open our eyes today, open our minds today, that we may see but also learn some lessons in the life of your servant, Joseph. In Jesus' name, amen. You will find in Matthew chapter 1, and, and we're not going to have this part on the screen, but you're going to find Matthew starts out with the lineage of Jesus. He starts out with the lineage, rather, of Joseph, clear back to Abraham. This is important. About halfway through there, you, saw, you see David as the father of all of these people that follow David. David was the king of of Israel. He was the king of Judah. He was the king of the Jewish people, the first king chosen by God. And you see through this lineage that Matthew writes that Joseph ultimately comes from this same line, uh, uh, same line as David. Again, he was the first king chosen by God. He was the second king of Israel. The first king of Israel was chosen by man, and he didn't pan out very well. That ought to be a lesson for all of us. The second king was chosen by God, and here we have his line continuing on even through Joseph. And I bring this up to point out, maybe from a new perspective, Joseph was not a nobody. Sometimes we think of Joseph and Mary as what you and I, in, these, in this term, or in these contexts, may call a peasant. But Joseph was not a nobody. Joseph was nobility. Believe it or not, his line, his family line, extended clear back to the king unbroken. He was royalty as we look through the genealogy of Matthew. For all we know, in Joseph's day, the crown that sat on Herod's head belonged to Joseph, as far as we know. Now, he was certainly not recognized as a noble much less a king, and all that happened from a big mess in the Israelite history after their return from Babylon. Herod the Great was in place as king over the Jewish people. He was placed there by Rome. But it's interesting, later, in later years in world history, if this was in France, or if this was in England, or if this was in pre-revolution Russia, Joseph would have a title. He would have land. He would have serfs on his land. He would be set up if this was in other cultures and in a later time. But in practice, Joseph was a commoner. 
We have no reason to believe through Scripture that Joseph's family was uh, wealthy, that he was a wealthy man. We have no reason to believe that he was destitute. The important thing is that Joseph was a part of this unbroken line that went clear back to King David, the very first king chosen by God over the Israelite people, over the Jewish people. And we can go back even further, and we can trace that lineage back to Judah. And, and I like how Cliff pointed that out today. He was a part of an unbroken line clear back to Abraham. It was important that Joseph was a part of this royal line. Both Mary and Jesus would inherit this royal line, although we'll find something interesting about Mary as well. Though Jesus is the creator and sovereign of everything, he takes on this royal line of Joseph. Something else, just for your information, I, I don't want people to get confused or, or doubt as they go through the Christmas story. You may have read through the genealogy of Joseph, or you may have read through the genealogy of Christ in Matthew, and you may have read through the genealogy in Luke, and you'll notice a difference as these two authors write this down, as they record these things. After David, in fact, they are completely different. David goes to Solomon in Matthew's genealogy, and David goes to Nathan in Luke's genealogy. This is not an error. In fact, the Jewish people were meticulous record keepers. They would put a baseball statistician to shame. They're always recording everything. In fact, during the Ptolemic time, they were, they were actually called to Alexandra to, to write down and, and record the history of the Jewish people. And we still use, biblical scholars still use those rec records today when understanding and deciphering Scripture. One explanation between these two, uh, and, and this is held by some, although I think it's just a part of the answer and not the complete answer, is that Matthew is tracing the biological line of Joseph, and Luke is tracing what's known as the leveret line of Joseph. And, and a leveret marriage is simply this. If, if, if I am married and, and I've got a brother and I die, my brother has a responsibility to marry my widow and have children, particularly sons. Seems a little strange maybe to us, but back in that day, in that culture and in that time, a woman who had no husband, a woman who had no sons, was in a very precarious and dangerous position. Now, you can read through the account of Ruth, and, and that'll kind of explain some of these things. And so perhaps Luke recorded the Leverett marriage line, and Matthew recorded the biological line. I think that's part of the answer, but I don't think that's the whole answer. In fact, in Matthew chapter 12, you could, or Matthew chapter 1 verse 12 is a good example of Matthew doing the same thing. This is, this is you, you find Shealtiel as the father of Zerubbabel. Well, Shealtiel wasn't actually the father of Zerubbabel. Shealtiel's brother, Padiah, was the father of Zerubbabel. But I was a famous foot doctor way back then. But he was the father of Zerubbabel. Shealtiel was not. However, Matthew records Shealtiel as being the father of Zerubbabel. That's an example of this leveret line. So both of these authors are doing this. Really, I think most scholars, at least conservative scholars today, take the view that Luke is recording the line of Mary and Matthew is recording the line of of Joseph. Matthew is recording the line of Joseph, uh, legal, or Jesus' legal father in Joseph through David and Solomon, and Luke is following the blood relative line through Mary. There are many things in Scripture that require, guys, if we're, if we're going to study, if we're going to know, if we're going to see Everything that God has to offer. This is one example of those times where you have to really get into it. You have to really dive into it. You have to begin asking questions and dissect things. And my guess is many people have read through different genealogies before throughout history and wondered the question and didn't ask. And the solutions are pretty simple for many of them. So this is why we see a slight discrepancy. But let's look at Matthew Chapter 1, we're going to start in verse 18. Matthew chapter 1, starting in verse 18. 
Matthew writes this, this is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. And I love the way Matthew starts that. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. It's not we think, or perhaps, or probably, or I'm guessing this works. Matthew's absolutely certain. You see, Matthew had the opportunity to talk to, discuss, to, to interact with a lot of the players in the Christmas story later on in life. And these two, Joseph and Mary, were pledged to be married. This was as good as being married without actually officially going through the ceremony. These marriages in this time were usually arranged marriages. And, and this is common throughout the world. It was common throughout history. It's not common for us, but I, I, I got news for you. We're the, we're the new people on the block, okay? This, the way we uh, have marriages today involving a romantic connection, uh, you go throughout the majority of human history. You even go throughout the majority of cultures in the world today. They look at that as very, very strange. These people are nuts doing it this way. Well, yeah, well, hey, we're Christian. We are crazy, right? We know that. And so it, we're kind of new on the block. These were arranged marriages. A contract was prepared in which the groom's parents paid a bride price, which is very, very strange even and of itself because later on in history it went the other way. The bride's parents paid a dowry. Well, back in this time, the groom's parents paid a price to the, to the family for the bride. And this contract was immediately deemed binding with the couple considered to be married even though the actual ceremony hadn't taken place, even though the consummation of the marriage had not taken a place and wouldn't occur for a long time, at least a year afterward. It was a time of, of testing of fidelity for this couple. They had very little contact with one another. Sometimes they didn't even know each other very well. And parts of this are not totally different from the way we do things today. We are engaged very often to be married, and we agree to be faithful to one another. We make a commitment to one another, and hopefully we remain faithful until marriage happens. Marriage happens a little bit later. And these, these arranged marriages very often, you can see this throughout Scripture, they're very often done with the consent of both the bride and the groom. This happens regularly. It didn't always happen with their consent, but it happened regularly with their consent. I don't want us to get a, a bad picture right off the bat of Joseph. I don't want us to get a bad picture right off the bat of Mary. Okay, we, we tend to look at arranged marriages as bad because we've been conditioned to see them as bad. We've been conditioned to see them for two re or in two ways. Number one, we're not used to it. It's not normal for us. And secondly, you hear about the bad stuff. You hear about... Uh, uh, men and women who take advantage of this kind of thing. But in reality, it was actually a beautiful union between a man and a woman. This is how it came about. They were pledged to be married. Continuing on in verse 18, but before they came together, she, that is Mary, was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Church, this is a serious problem. I don't want you to see back 2,000 years right now. Remember, we're looking at this from a new perspective. I want you to put yourself in the shoes of Joseph. This was a serious problem. And I think this is where we begin to see Joseph's character and the fact that God chose well. We're going to be able to compare, if you will, the things that Joseph does and the decisions he makes, and we're going to be able to reflect upon our own lives. You know, you've probably heard the question asked, what would Jesus do? Well, I don't want you to ask that question right now. I want you to ask the question, what would you do? What would you do if you were Joseph? Use your imagination. Put yourself in Joseph's shoes. This was a personal insult to Joseph. As far as he knew, a personal insult to him. It was a personal insult to his family. They just made an agreement. Their honor, and to a certain extent, their future depends upon this union. Add to the fact now that you may not even have any type of romantic connection to the supposed offender. 
I'll tell you what, it's easy to think that if Joseph and I were the same person, we'd be walking out the door. On top of that, there are two courts in your favor if you're Joseph. Number one, the court of public opinion. And number two, the judicial court. Get rid of her. In fact, punish her for these horrible things. Whatever Joseph is about to do will show us whether or not God chose well. And in the middle of that, Joseph has a choice. You see, I think we can begin to reflect upon our own character. We can begin to reflect upon our own spiritual maturity if we use our imagination, if we come from a new perspective. I think we can look at our own priorities. You know what? We can start looking at our own confidence and our own self-worth. What are some of the things we experience or would experience when these types of things happen? First of all, sadness. And I'm sure Joseph experienced the same thing. His betrothed, as far as he knows, was unfaithful. She cheated on him. And now he's got a whole big mess to deal with. He's sad. Maybe you go through despair. You ever ask yourself this question, what did I do wrong? I wonder if Joseph wrestled with that for a while. What did I do wrong? I, I don't measure up. I couldn't even do this right. You know, that often maybe leads to embarrassment, doesn't it? Embarrassment. This is not the way life is supposed to be. This is not the way I planned this. I can't believe these things are happening to me. I'm embarrassed when I talk to my family. I'm embarrassed when I talk to my friends. I'm embarrassed about this and I'm embarrassed about that. Sometimes though it gets a little deeper and it goes to anger, right? Now you're angry with the offender. You might even go deeper than that. You begin to hate. You begin to hate the one who did wrong. You begin to hate the one who hurt you. Sometimes it even goes to retaliation. Retaliation. Mary, you're pregnant? Who was it? Bob down the street? I'll be back. Stay here. Hold on. The way we think sometimes. It can even go to retaliation. But now we get to reflect upon our character. We get to see Joseph's character very rarely. Though occasionally, but rarely do we ask, what is best for the offender? What is best for the one who has done wrong? What can I do to begin to restore the life of the one who has made a mistake? Do we ever ask those questions? Do we ever go that route? What kind of a man does it take? I'll tell you, there are a lot of people in Scripture that I want to meet, but after I become a father, first and foremost, more than anything else, I want to meet Joseph. I want to meet him. What kind of a guy is it that God chose to raise Jesus? Who is that? What's he like? What's, what are his lessons like? What's his patience like? What does he do when he makes mistakes? All of these wonderful things. Often we don't ask how can we restore the offender. We ask how do I fix my pride? How do I fix my position? What are my friends going to say? What are my friends going to think? And Joseph's in quite a pickle here, church. Look at verse 19. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law. In fact, your translation may say because he was a righteous man and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had mind to divorce her quietly. Joseph was a righteous man. Joseph was faithful to the law of God. Joseph was a pious man. Joseph wanted to do right. Joseph wanted to follow the law. He's got a, he's got a, a moral dilemma here, church. Incidentally, this is another lesson. It's not part of, the, part of the sermon. It's another lesson we can learn. A moral dilemma for a Christian is between two rights. So if you're ever caught in a moral dilemma, I can take about two-thirds of your headache away. It's between two rights. For a Christian, a moral dilemma is not between a right and a wrong. Do what's right. End of discussion. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying it's fun. But you do what's right. A moral dilemma is not between two wrongs. You don't do either one of them. It's very hard, but you don't. A moral dilemma is between two rights. And this is what Joseph is faced with. Between two rights. And what are the two rights? Mercy and judgment. 
mercy and judgment, and it's all up to him. Mercy and judgment, all he has to do is say the word. And he is struggling inside of the law of God. He wanted to follow the law. What does the law say? Well, Exodus chapter 20, these are the Ten Commandments. You know these. If a man commits adultery with another man's wife, with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteress are to be put to death. That's pretty severe. I'll tell you why it's severe in just a moment. But really, specifically, we find this particular law in Deuteronomy 22. Deuteronomy 22 says this. If a man happens to meet in a town, a virgin pledged to be married, and he sleeps with her, you shall take both of them to the gate of that town, stone them. Put them to death. And that's all Joseph has to say. Do it. I wonder if he's filled with rage. I wonder if you'd be filled with rage. Instead of compassion and forgiveness. These are pretty harsh laws. They are pretty harsh responses. But this is not because God hates people. It's because God hates evil. I'll tell you what. I want to, I want to challenge you someday. Go through all of scripture and find out what God hates and what God doesn't hate. Everything God hates is harmful to you and me. Everything he hates brings us harm. And so God hates evil. He says you need to purge the evil from your land. He hates the pain that it causes. But there's a moral battle going on inside of Joseph again, and yet he did not want to expose her to public disgrace. Why not expose her, Joe? As far as you know, she deserves it. As far as you know, she's been evil. Here's the thing. She's not the only one. I imagine if you take into consideration the morally perfect standard of God, we all deserve judgment. I know I deserve judgment. And I, that's, not just, that's not just saying it. I know my actions. I know my thoughts. But I don't fear judgment because judgment was poured out upon Christ. And so what did he do? He had mind to divorce her quietly. You know what this is? This is the only thing Joseph has in an attempt to keep her honor intact. He's been wronged. He's been wronged severely. And thinks, what can I do to keep her honor intact, to restore her as best I can? James 2.12 says this, speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom, because judgment without mercy, without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. And here is the man who is going to be responsible for raising Jesus. God chose well. God chose well. Joseph hasn't even made the decision as to whether or not he's going to raise the boy. But God chose well. Verses 20 and 21. But after he'd considered this, that is, divorcing Mary quietly, that is, showing compassion, that is, trying to restore the best way that he can, after he'd considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. That's Joshua. It means God saves, because he will save his people from their sins. Oh, well, that's easy then. I guess that squares it away. Joseph's got an easy decision to make, right? He went to sleep and had a dream, okay? And now he's got to act upon that, either for it or against it. He went to sleep and he had a dream. And now he's got to decide whether or not he wants to be involved in a scandal and take on a child or if he wants to consider judgment and remove himself from the situation. You talk about faith. You talk about faith. Joseph is a faithful man. Faith is trust. This is acting upon trust. Joseph had a decision to make based upon the evidence given, and it was a dream. 
Don't think for a second that this was easy. Don't think for a second. It's Jesus himself that says, even if people come back from the dead, people won't believe. Even if people come back from the dead, they won't believe in Jesus Christ. You think it was easy to believe a dream? You think it was easy to act on a dream? Don't think for a second that this was easy. If he agrees to this, he's relying upon this dream to go against his culture. He's relying upon this dream to go against 2,000 years of law and tradition. He's always also going against what the law of God says. Furthermore, he's inviting potential trouble and unrest into his life. And we know it. Jesus isn't even two years old before they're fugitives on the run to, to Egypt. Because Herod's trying to kill him. Don't forget, the angel did not just tell Joseph to accept Mary. The angel told Joseph to accept a son that was, number one, not his. You know, it's highly likely that Joseph died before Jesus' ministry began. Jesus' ministry began around 30 years old, and it's very likely Joseph passed away before that. We don't have any record. We don't see Joseph anywhere in the gospel account in Jesus' ministry. And if Joseph would have died then, it would have been a big deal. We would have had a record of that. We see Mary multiple times throughout Jesus' ministry. But we don't have any record of Joseph. There's no mention of his death. He's conspicuously absent at the wedding where Jesus performed his first miracle. We're fairly certain he was dead by the time Jesus' crucifixion rolled around because Jesus charged John with taking care of Mary after his death. All of this suggests that Joseph did a great deal to teach and to raise and to show Jesus what a righteous man was in a short amount of time. And it wasn't even his child. It wasn't even his child. God chose well. God chose well with Joseph. Second thing he was asked to do was accept Mary and this child who was conceived by the Holy Spirit. Joseph is no fool. He knows that this doesn't happen. He knows it didn't happen. He knows it didn't happen all throughout history. What are the chances that it's happening now? What are the chances that it's happening to him? And yet, even with this something in the back of his mind that says, I know for man this is impossible. For God, it is possible. Matthew 1, 22 and 23, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, a virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel. Again, Emmanuel meaning God with us. That's a prophecy from Isaiah. Verses 22 and 23 now that we just read, they're not a part of the angel's message. The angel gave the message and now this is Matthew back in, in narration here. And so it makes me wonder, it makes me wonder what the all this line means. All this. All this took place. Yeah, I understand the virgin conception. But could it be that all this included Joseph's righteous actions? Could it be that all of this included the fact that God chose Joseph? And then he knew that he would be patient. He knew that he would show compassion he knew that he would be merciful he knew that he would submit to the guidance and direction of God for his pregnant wife even raise this child who was not his Matthew says all this took place to fulfill prophecy God chose well God chose well at 24 and 25 Joseph had a decision to make. Yes, he had a decision. He was allowed to choose, church. Joseph was allowed to just didn't change anything. God didn't turn him into a puppet, didn't turn him into a robot. Joseph was still allowed to choose. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. It's a big move. It's a bold move. But he did not consummate their marriage, and so she gave birth to a son. He gave him the name Jesus. I think God chose well. You know what I find most fascinating about this story? 
Joseph was told all about this after Mary conceived. Not before. God wasn't getting Joseph's opinion. Hey, what do you think? Here's the way I'm going to play this out. No, God said this is the way it's going to be. Joseph, you're either in or you're out. What's your choice? What's your choice? And God chose to submit to the desire and will of God because he was a righteous man. God chose Joseph well. And it begs the question, and I ask myself this all the time. I ask myself this when I see, when I think about a guy like Joseph, when I see men and women who raise their children to know who Jesus is. Begs the question, would God choose me? Would God choose you? And I don't necessarily mean raising Jesus. But would God choose you when faith has to be shown? Would God choose you when it has to be lived? Would God choose you? And I want you to ask yourself this question. Would God choose you if reverence must be given? Would God choose you if risk had to be taken? Would God choose you if mercy had to triumph over judgment? Would God choose you when the challenge must be answered? This has nothing to do with being man or woman. It has nothing to do with being the strongest or the smartest or the wealthiest. Church, it has nothing to do with it being the most convenient. It has nothing to do with earning salvation. It has to do with the same thing that we've talked about throughout these past couple weeks that we're going to talk about at length next year it has to do with the fact that he trusted God. He trusted God. God chose well with Joseph. We think of Christmas as a time of peace, a time of love, a time of joy, a time of giving, a time of laughter, a time of singing. Joseph's first Christmas was one of apprehension. It was one of sadness. It was one of confusion. But it was one of trust. It was one of mercy. It was one of love. As you know, for all we know, we reap the benefits, every one of us, that Joseph made the choice he made. I think God chose well. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for choosing Joseph to take on this role. We thank you, Father, that you did not make him choose. But through all the things that led through his life to that moment, he had this trust and this reverence for who you are and what you are, that he would take on the hardship and difficulty of raising Jesus. We thank you, Father, that throughout our life, you put servants time after time after time in our place that you have chosen to glorify your son. Father, we ask, as we reflect upon the decisions that Joseph made, that we would be those servants as well, used throughout time to extend this line to glorify Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Please stand and sing.
Well, two things before we break. Number one, um, we teach a lot, and I've, I've taught a lot about not worrying, okay? And with Christmas cookies and, and sweets and everything, I tend to worry about my waistline sometimes. I'm not going to do that this year, okay? I want to lead by example, and that's a sacrifice I'm willing to make, okay? Number one. Number two, this Christmas season, you might be confronted. You might be confronted today with what's easy and convenient and what's right. And you've probably been confronted over this past year with those choices. Same thing Joseph was confronted with. What's better? What's easy? What's convenient? Well, it's, I can just wash my hands of the whole thing or doing what is right. I hope you learn from Joseph's example. Let's pray. Father, we thank you once again for the love that you have for us, the love that you've shown. We thank you for the love that you continue to show, not just this body, but your creation. We know that we live in a very difficult and dangerous world, Father. But we also know that you reign eternally and that we eventually experience and know this rest that we have with Jesus Christ. And for that, we praise you and we worship you. And we thank you, Father, that you chose uh, in this time so many, many years ago uh, that Jesus would, uh, would be a man, would be a human being, would die for our sins. And frankly, that you would go to Mary and Joseph uh, to raise this child in Jesus' name.